Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna to talk to you about the top five things that controls and automation engineers do. So one of the most watched videos on my channel is the top five things you need to know about controls in the automation engineering. And in that video, I talk about things like pay range, uh, what sort of background in education you should look for, what sort of projects you could do, all sorts of things, but I don't really dive too much into what the actual day-to-day -day looks like for a controls and automation engineer. I didn't really expect that video to do as well as it did, but it's over like 20,000 views, and I think it is my most liked video, so so I figured this is a field of engineering that is somewhat niche and not getting a lot of people talking about it, but there's clearly a lot of curiosity around the field. So I wanted to make this video to dive a little bit more into the technical things that you can expect to do as a controls and automation engineer. Also, we are at 6,000 subscribers on the channel, which is just so cool to me. So a massive thank you to everybody who has subscribed to the channel, leaving likes on my videos, commenting nice things on the videos, a massive, massive massive thank you to my Patreon supporters who have made this growth on the channel possible. Now this video obviously can't completely dive deeply into everything a controls and automation engineer should expect to do, but I am going to try to highlight the most common things that I have seen in the industry that the fields have in common and you should expect to be exposed to. In general, all controls and automation engineers should expect to be tasked with optimizing and automating formerly manual processes or somewhat automated processes at a plant and finding ways to make them run automatically or semi-automatically better than before in a more safe fashion, in a higher quality fashion, in a way that improves throughput. Those are some of the most common things they all have in common. So let's dive into the main tasks and responsibilities that come with a role like that. So the number five thing we're gonna talk about is networking and advanced communication protocols. So this covers ethernet, serial, hard, Modbus, uh, Fieldbus, even Wi-Fi and wireless connectivity. Basically anything more complicated than just hooking up a wire and saying it's on, it's off. While a larger or well-run company might have networking specialists who take some of this load off your plate, it's almost impossible today to not get exposed to a substantial amount of advanced device protocols. Any application bigger than like a standalone SCID is going to require networking between a main PLC or pro programmable logic controller and racks of remote IO and individual devices themselves such as scales or flow meters often now have heart or ethernet or serial some type of advanced pr protocol where it's not just hardwiring the signal back to your PLC. And then on top of that you may be expected to have a pretty good understanding of industrial network design. This is basically like your switches and your network topology often this is run with fiber and it can be an entire different different theoretical space that you might need to get an understanding of. Again, most companies, integrators, and internally will task a lot of this to either an IT team or a dedicated network team or systems, computer systems team. But you will need to be exposed to it because as a controls and automation engineer, you at least need to know how to talk to it and what sort of work is required to put new devices on the system. And another layer on top of that that I'm just going to lightly touch on is like server design and server topology. We're definitely into the space where probably a computer engineer or a dedicated IT server team would be setting up a lot of your servers. But as a controls and automation engineer, it's such a wide ranging task. You should probably at least be aware that there are times you'll be asked to sort of troubleshoot why computers aren't working, why messaging across platforms isn't working, potentially even checking out like why software services that were installed aren't working. So your world can feel a little bit like IT at times. Item number four is going to be hardware specification, panel design and checkout, as well as the CAD drawings affiliated with that. So this is another Another one that can vary wildly depending on your role. Some places uh, your task as the controls engineer is just to specify the control specific hardware components. So this is typically like input and output cards, the actual PLCs, chassis, fuses, circuit breakers, power distribution modules, sometimes switches, and things that are specific to the control system. But at some roles, they'll also want to extend that out to actually buying the pumps, motors, 
conveyors, valves, safety devices, e-stops, light curtains, you name it, and they'll want the controls and automation engineer to essentially double as an instrumentation engineer. So you do need to be aware of some basic concepts of electrical engineering for this, as well as very often some mechanical or even chemical engineering if you're working in a chemical plant. Also, depending on the role, this could come with some significant CAD, which is computer-aided design, work. Either you'll need to be able to read CAD drawings and make sure your panel matches what's on the drawings, mark them up, typically known as red lines, and submit them back to a CAD division for fixes if your company has a CAD contractor or division or you'll need to get familiar yourself with a tool like uh, Autodesk, TrueView, something that lets you mark up PNIDs, um, where you basically have to be the one in charge of making sure that the documentation on your control panels is accurate and up to date. So hardware is definitely a very important part of these roles, but it can vary from just being familiar with the concepts to doing a ton of hands-on electrical work. A lot of it might actually depend on your comfort level with these things too, because the more you feel comfortable taking on, the more your work will probably let you take on. All right, number three is gonna be reporting and data historization, data tracking, and SQL databases, and MES enterprise level data monitoring tools. The desire to have historical data and a way of tracking past events in your plant is getting bigger and bigger and more in demand than ever. Now we are much more moving towards a standard where having essentially every Every controls point from valves, pumps, e-stops, temperatures, pressures, flows, scale weights, every single point tracked historically, um, as well as batch-oriented reports or even daily or monthly operations reports that can summarize functionality around the plant in a high-level, easy-to-read report. Good news about a historian is it's typically a software supplied by the same people that would su supply like your SCADA HMI plant-wide HMI software, but it's usually as simple as linking either a PLC tag or an HMI tag to your historian so that you have of tracking over time and historian tools in my experience are very easy to add points to but the next level of essentially industrial data science is where it gets a bit trickier when you're not just talking about a raw signal tracked over time but you start to talk about like batch reports or summary reports something that's giving you a high level view of a process over a period of time and most of the time the way this works is your PLC or your batch system or sometimes even your HMI will trigger a an event that writes a series of data to your PLC or to your SQL historian database. And this information will get compiled into either like SQL server reporting services, SSRS reports, or if you're slick and you have something cloud hosted, maybe like a Power BI report. SQL reports do straddle kind of the line between what a controls engineer should probably be responsible for and what like a software or networking or IT member should be responsible for. But you should not be surprised if you get exposed to some of it. Lastly, in this category, I want to briefly touch on MESs, which stand for Manufacturing Execution Systems. It's normal for these to combine kind of enterprise level elements of like inventory tracking, quality control, as well as sometimes live process managing. And very normally rolls some of those historical trends or even batch reports into an MES tool. Most normal way you're going to be exposed to this is your plant decides to put one in or maintain it and you go to a contract or a company that does this specifically. As a controls and automation engineer, you should expect that you'll need to be one of the most trained people on the MES system, but it will typically be a subject matter expert's job to install and set that up. Now, number two, the second most common thing you're probably gonna do as a controls and automation engineer is HMI or graphical user interface uh, development. So HMI, human machine interface, or GUI, GUI, graphical user interface, pretty much interchange interchangeable terms, but it is one of the most common aspects of being a controls and automation engineer 
engineer and fortunately one of the easiest to explain and understand. You are basically creating the visual go-between for your plant operators and production team to be able to interact with the control system without having to touch the code running on your PLCs. Most of the time, unless you're being asked to create a system from scratch, your plant will already have HMI standards like what they typically look like, as well as defining what sort of information should be shown on main screens, what short sort of information should be reserved for pop-ups or device faceplates, things like that. And so most of the time, you're not just asked to invent a scheme for HMIs. And even beyond that, if you are asked to create a system from scratch, this is something you should be working closely with operators, production engineers, process engineers, and getting everybody's feedback on what needs to be seen on what screens, what's confusing, what's not confusing, what's the right way to display this stuff. And then the, the tricky thing, the reason a controls engineer gets involved is you need to tag this stuff and you need to tie pumps to animated tags that change the color of the pump when it's running and when it's not running. You need to make an animated level bar on the tanks that show what the level transmitter for that tank is reading. So really figuring out how to marry like the visual elements of your screens with the PLC tags that tell you about the process and then defining levels of security so only operators can do certain things but then engineers and supervisors can do another layer of things. That typically falls under the umbrella of your HMI, typically within your SCADA system. It's SCADA, S-C-A-D-A, and that's typically what a plant-wide control system, or sometimes multiple plants, but security would be defined in that SCADA system, as well as user accounts, logins, parameters, things like that. That's number two. And just before we dive into the number one thing controls and automation engineers get exposed to, I want to talk about a tool for getting some of these cross-disciplinary engineering skills. You need a lot of well-rounded engineering skills to be a good controls and automation engineer, and that really applies to every field of engineering today. I'm a big believer in lifelong learning. That's why I started this YouTube channel, and that's actually how I found Brilliant. Brilliant is one of the best tools I have ever seen for learning math, electrical engineering concepts, computer science, and a lot more. The entire thing is super interactive, and it works on the phone so you can do it all on the go. I've recently done two pretty aggressive career switches and job hunts and had interviews with some of the top engineering companies in the world, including Disney Imagineering, Tesla, and SpaceX, and I knew there were such a wide variety of things they could grill me on that I was definitely not prepared for. PLC hardware requires an understanding of electrical engineering. Writing process code and developing SQL reports requires data science. Even designing motion systems or mechanical piping systems requires both mechanical engineering and chemical chemical engineering concept, I found Brilliant and replaced endlessly scrolling through social media with bite-sized Brilliant lessons from my phone. I never felt like I was sitting through school or being exposed to unnecessary information. And I can't think of a better way of explaining how sincere a fan of Brilliant I am other than just showing you guys I subscribed to this app way back in March and we didn't become channel partners until July. I think they're awesome. Their mission statement lines up exactly with mine for this channel. Check the link in the description below if you want to check them out. I believe they're even offering a free trial so you can try it risk-free. Now let's talk about the number one thing controls and automation engineers do. Number one is PLC programming, programmable logic controller programming. I have never met a controls and automation engineer with years of industry experience who didn't spend a substantial amount of their time doing PLC programming. Programmable logic controllers are the industry standard for how to run and automate factories. They are basically dedicated computers whose whole job is to be be ultra reliable, ultra fast, ultra responsive, and they're essentially manufactured for the sole purpose of automating systems. The main governing body in charge of defining standards for PLC programming is the International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC, and their 61131 programming languages define the five ways that you can program PLC, ladder, function block, sequential flowchart, structured text, and instruction list. I did put together a full video that does a deep dive into these languages if you're more curious about learning even more about them. In general, you can expect to need to be really proficient in one or two of them and have a general understanding of how they all work just so that you're well-rounded, ready for anything controls engineer. Now, the bad news is if you're interested in diving into this field, it's really hard to get a PLC and PLC programming software from one of the big industrial manufacturers.
catchers like Rockwell or Siemens because they are super expensive and they are designed for industry. But the good news is there are a few cheaper options like Automation Direct and Beckoff where you can get the programming software for free. But the other good news, the really good news is that if you learn some programming concepts and electrical concepts, like if you get an Arduino kit and you get familiar with Python, you're actually learning a lot of concepts that are going to help you in this industry, despite the fact you're not using the exact software or the exact hardware that you would in the industry. It might seem like it's not a one-to-one -one matchup because you're not using a Rockwell PLC and RS Logics 5000 in ladder logic. But the thing is, and you realize this when you've been exposed to a few programming languages or you've messed around with a few different electrical systems, is that the common concepts overlap so well industry to industry that there's no way you can be learning to code, learning to mess with electronics, and then you dive into the world of automation and controls and you're not ready to hit the ground running. You just have to learn the specific syntax of the system you're now in, whatever PLC manufacturer you're in, how to hook up to that PLC. But beyond that, the concepts remain the same. So there are free and cheap ways to get better at PLC programming and essentially every concept here, even before diving into the industry and needing thousands of dollars for software and hardware. Okay, so that is going to do it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. I've enjoyed sharing a bit more about my career and sharing a little bit more about this niche field of engineering. And I look forward to continuing to roll out great content for you guys. If you have an idea for a video, drop it in the comments below. Don't forget to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. And thank you so much for watching. See you next time.